When I was working on the short film Hiroshima, I started seeing some nightmares. The realization comes from the fact that this was a real event and these things have happened to real people. I remember in uh, an instance where uh, a professor told me that you will not make it here. Really? really. When you were in Germany? It, it, was, it, it was soul crushing. Really. Hello and welcome everyone to the first episode of my new podcast. My name is Amir and today's guest is my good friend Hashim. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Amir. So Hashim, you're a science communicator. You have more than, I think now, 34 million followers on Facebook. Is that correct? More than 30. 34 million, yeah. Yeah. You studied science yourself um, and you, uh, you're a speaker. You spoke at TEDx, but also you're a filmmaker. You did a science fiction short film called Simulation. Right. That's how we, how we both of us met many years ago. After that, you wrote a novel uh, based on the sci-fi short film Simulation. Right. And just recently, you dropped a new short film called Hiroshima, which I think gained like a, more than 100 million views on all of the social media platforms combined. That's right. Yeah, you, you don't get bored that easily, do you? Not really, you know, because of... Two things. First of all, I'm doing something I'm really passionate about. I love doing it. It doesn't feel like work at all. And second, you know, because of a wide range of projects that I'm involving myself in and the different things I keep trying from time to time, I just don't get bored. I try, you know, uh, graphics design, video production, directing, writing, whether it's writing for film or writing uh, books such as the novel that you just mentioned, um, to animations, visual effects. Having this diverse, uh, you know, these diverse things to do at once, it, it's very fulfilling. I love it and it, I never get burn, burned out or bored. Okay, so tell me if we talk about your when we start about you working as a science communicator, what what is it that drives your passion for making complex topics more accessible? Well, um, you know, it all started in 2009, actually, when I, when I was still doing my um, bachelor's degree. And I noticed that there was a rise of misinformation. Social media was booming at the time, still in its early stages. Facebook was, I mean, around four or five years old at that time. So people were getting into social media and I found it to be a fertile ground to reach more people. But at the same time, there were a lot of others who were spreading misinformation and I wanted to be one of the few people to tackle the spread of misinformation by communicating science from authentic sources, that is research papers. Uh, also, I was studying science uh, molecular biotechnology or biotechnology to be yeah, uh, more specific. And um, I wanted to combine my skills in content creation, which was something I was developing the years prior with my background in science and use that to communicate science effectively by creating highly engaging infographics. Video content was not really king at the time. It was mostly infographics. And I was posting a lot of infographics and they would go viral. It was always incredible. It never started with the goal of making money or anything. It, it has always been just passion. And because of that, it, I never get bored. And um, with that success that you've had, how did you, like when things took off, how was that for you? How did you deal with that? Was it... Like, it's not something that, that happens every day. So how it, was this new phase here? Yeah. Honestly, it was totally unexpected and it's still unbelievable even now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all of a sudden, just like that. I mean, think about it. I started creating content in 2009 and then all the way to 2015, I had 27,000 followers. So from 2009 to 2015, just 27,000. And then I noticed that Facebook started taking care of video content uh, in late 2015. And I published the first video, which got 8 million views. I was 
amazed. It's like, wait a second, mm -hmm. what's going on in here? <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, that was a boost. That was a motivation, even more motivation to what I already had to focus on video content. And so I continued publishing content. I published it in another video. And that got more than literally 300 million views. One video, believe it or not, brought 3 million subscribers or followers on Facebook in a single week. Okay. One video. That's and that, crazy. And that video, mm -hmm. which was about airplane safety system, mm -hmm. okay? You, you know, when planes crash, mm -hmm. you want to have a safety system. Some, some guy from Russia developed a concept with animation where if there is a plane that is crashing, the cabin will detach. Detaches. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Mm. The detached cabin. Mm. And, and the video has been on YouTube for many years. I just took it, I repurposed it, and I published it with his con uh, authorization, of course. He was very happy with the result. I was very happy with the result. And that's when I realized that, you know what? Video content, focus on that. And I made it my primary goal to focus on video content and it continued growing again. I had really no intention of doing all of this for the sake of making money. That and was the byproduct yeah. of all of this. Yeah. And, but how did you deal with it personally? Like how does, did your friends react to that or your family or what did it do with you personally? You know, I, I, I was amazed myself and honestly, I did not believe it. Mm -hmm. Um, my, I was employed at the time. Mm -hmm. I was working with the company as um, uh, basically managing content creation for futurism. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was that I was responsible for video content in the beginning. And they said, mm, it looks like we have some creative differences. So we're gonna switch you to content creation on articles and other stuff, supervise some other things. I said, okay, all while, working on my own stuff. And then they saw that, wait a second, you're bringing all these views and all these followers. No, 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 let's bring you back to video content creation. You will manage the video content. I was like, okay. So it was trial and error and I learned a lot from it. Uh, my friends, when they saw the numbers, they also <laughs> did not believe it. They yep. say, wait, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, it was amazing. And honestly, it's still amazing. It's still amazing. How, how, but how yeah. did it change you as a person? I mean, for example, I remember we met once, we were in Berlin at the Einstein Cafe and we were sitting there. Mm. And then I remember a bunch of women came over like, are you hashing the science? Oh, you yeah. remember the science influencer I guy? Do. And I, like, can you, you know, yeah. and they, I think they gave you flowers or something. I remember that. No, they didn't give me flowers. <laughs> but, no, but I, I think <laughs> they so. They recognized yeah. me. Yeah. They recognized me. Yeah. Uh, it was a very weird feeling, okay. to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't appear very often in my content. So for people to recognize me, it's interesting, but um, yeah, there are a few people who recognize me in the streets. But to, for me as a person, honestly, it, it, it didn't change much because my primary focus is not really publicity or fame or any of that. It's really making value, adding value to people's lives by providing them uh, amazing content that they enjoy and learn from. And uh, you do so many, like, as I mentioned in the beginning, filmmaking, writing, um, the new short film that you did, we're going to talk about that later. You, you did everything by yourself, all the VFX, sound design, correct. editing, everything. Um, it seems like a pretty packed schedule. How do you manage, how do you, like, how do you manage that? Do you ever, you said you never get into burnout or anything, but like, does yeah. it ever become stressful or how, how, how does it affect you? Honestly, no, it has never become stressful. Uh, so the way I manage my time is, uh, what I do is I work on a long term project like the short film Hiroshima, which, which took six months. But at the same time on the side, I'm also doing these small projects. You can still see daily video content, yeah? And these, these short projects that are done in parallel with the long-term project help me have diversity of things around me. Because if, if you just really stick to one thing for a really long time, you will definitely feel burned out no matter what, mm. yeah? And at the same time, I 
you know, from time to time I take a vacation to really just break the routine and come back. Very short vacations, unfortunately, mm -hmm. just one or two weeks maximum mm -hmm. per year. And that's um, all the vacation you do? Like you never take like, I don't that, know. That's no, honestly. Really? No, no. Okay. That's all the vacation. It's just one or two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Where I just travel somewhere to change the routine and the atmosphere and then come back with fresh ideas. And it has always been helpful. But you said, uh, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, why didn't you take any vacation that's longer, for example, like a month or something, just, you know, like completely uh, reset? You know, even during my vacations, mm. I also end up working sometimes. Mm. So. <laughs> so it's hard for you to, to shut down <laughs> yes. and not work? I, I, yes, mm. I would say I'm really glad that these social media platforms, all of them almost now, have scheduling. You can schedule content for a whole two weeks or months. And you can just leave and come back when you're ready. Okay. Um, and so I do schedule content before going. Sometimes I really just, if I want to take complete day off of social media, it'll probably be one or two days where I just don't log in into anything or yeah, don't read the news or any of that stuff. And this helps me uh, recharge. And are you able to, to detox from social media if you take like one or two days off? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and mm. it's not difficult to readjust. Mm. Uh, it takes time to readjust if you really go on a longer vacation, mm. like one week or two weeks. Yeah. yeah. And what do you do like in your, in your daily routine or daily life to, to, to not, I want, don't want to say to cope, but you know, to smooth things out, you know, like. Right. Yeah. Right. Of course. Of course. So here's the thing. Mm. I mean, you have worked with visual effects, right? And yeah. animations. Mm -hmm. It's stressful. It's it's crazy. It's stressful. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'm working on a scene for a video or a film for a film. And then when the scene is uh, is done, I, I let it render for a few hours. While it is rendering, I am working on my other content. It could be like the short videos. It could be writing scripts, talking to um, my video editor. And it could also be watching a film. One of the things that I always do is when I'm working, I also have a second screen next to me where I'm watching something. Okay. It's always the case. That's why when you ask me about any film, I'll say, oh yeah, I've seen that already. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> because it's running because there's a second okay. screen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm watching yeah. on a second screen, all these films that give me inspiration. And, uh, even though sometimes they end up like a background noise. I still get what the idea or the premise is, but, but doing all of these things in parallel, uh, sometimes going out with some friends, yeah, to chat about other things that do not concern work or other stuff that I'm working on. All of these factors really help, uh, continue creating valuable content without feeling bored or without getting burned out. Mm -hmm. And then you're in a, yeah. in a good position because, you know, the reason I'm asking is that I do know a lot of people who are very much, you know, also very ambitious and doing a lot of stuff. And the thing is that, you know, especially when they get to a point where they're having su success with what they do, that mm. they are, you know, the way how their brain works, the, the dopamine, you know, that, that, that gets released into the body when they try to take some time off, they can't, but it seems that, that you found a good, yeah, because you know, that's like, why would they, why would they not be able to? Because, because they're in this, um, they're in this mode where basically it's like a background, it's running in the background, you know, in the, in the RAM basically of their brain, like I could still do this and still that. So it makes it difficult for them to be present in the moment. And this is, you know, basically like their brain is so much in working mode that they can't enjoy their time off. So, um, but this is when you don't take care of yourself, but you said that you do take time off. You do go out with your friends and so on. So cook. I like yeah. cooking. As okay. well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's also a recreational activity that allows you to. <laughs> yeah come up with ideas as yeah. well. So they're yeah. still like a life apart from the screen, basically. Oh, def yeah. Definitely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your short film, 
Hiroshima or Hiroshima. We still don't know what's the right pronunciation. We still or don't do know we? what's the right yeah, pronunciation. We still don't, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You released it, I think, like two weeks ago, approximately. I did. And, Probably uh, less, yeah. slightly less. Okay. A little a little over a week. Okay. Yeah. And now it's it has, like we said, like 110 million views and yes. very controversial uh, comments. There. Very controversial comments. Now yeah. the Japanese are stepping in mm. in the comment section. Okay. Is it uh, what you expected? In the short. Look, uh, there is more than almost 90,000 comments from mm. across all social media platforms. Mm. I really wanted to know the ratio of how many people agree versus disagree mm -hmm. with dropping the atomic bomb. Yeah. Uh, I think the best way to do that is to combine all these comments uh, into a single file, copy paste them and then upload them to ChatGPT and say, you know what, read all the comments, analyze the ratio. Believe mm -hmm. it or not, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But I can't go through all the comments. I've read a lot of them mm -hmm. and uh, it really depends on the platform. On Facebook, most of the people, it also depends on the demographics. Mm -hmm. For example, on Facebook, a lot of uh, people who follow my content are from the US. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of people from the US who approve of dropping the atomic bomb. On YouTube, on that YouTube short, which has 50, more than 50 million views, there are people from all countries, yeah? And so there are a lot of who question, a lot of people who question dropping the atomic bomb. So it really depends on the platform, the distribution of the audience, the demographics. Um, but if we say for the most part, if we, I mean, based on my uh, reading of the comments so far, I would say around 35 to 40 percent of the people disapprove and the rest are okay with it. They say, you know what, it had to be done. Mm. Don't touch our boats. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, wow. In terms of filmmaking comments, mm. people said, oh, this is the scene that was missing from open Yeah, yeah, I've read that <laughs> and it's true, basically. <laughs> They're like, so we were sitting in the movies for, for three hours and we saw no explosion. And then... Good thing and and when this, the explosion yeah, came, yeah. it didn't look that great. Mm. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's, it, I know it's practical effect and they did a real explosion, but it honestly had nothing to do with the look of how a nuclear explosion would feel and look. Honestly, I think it's time for Christopher Nolan to embrace visual effects and CGI. He, has, this, he has this? already yeah. he has already praised a lot of films that use CGI. Mm. And, and there are complex shots that cannot be accomplished without CGI. He should really just embrace it. And was it. this your, your motivation to... Um to do this short film or what was the idea? How did you get to, to do this, that? This was one of the motivations, okay? Uh, but honestly, it's um, the new, uh, the recent threats between NATO and Russia of using nuclear weapons, yeah? They are, they are basically threatening each other as if they are like firecrackers. But these are deadly weapons that could annihilate entire civilizations. And um, that was the primary motivation. The second motivation is, of course, have that self-satisfaction that Oppenheimer is now complete. <laughs> okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you did your job there, great. That, I hope it honestly, reaches Nolan as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. You know, uh, uh, the visual effects are very uh, primitive for his taste, mm. but still. Okay. Um, yeah. But uh, the color grading, mm -hmm. when 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 uh, I instructed the color grader or the colorist, I say, please, let's replicate the same color grading of Oppenheimer. So if you take the scene and <laughs> stitch it to any part, it will feel like it blends in. Yeah. Uh, nice I idea. did, however, see. I did, however, see some. Uh, comments from uh, Japanese people. Some of them say that uh, it did look Japanese, it did convey Japanese culture, but there are things that are inaccurate. One guy commented that if you want to uh, make a film about Japan, you have to either hire Japanese stuff, Japanese staff and crew, or uh, do your research. I was like, okay, this whole film costs what? Three thousand uh, dollars, not one hundred fifty million or two hundred uh, million, uh, to really go to that level. So 
let's accept it for what it is. It's all about the message that it conveys. Absolutely. Right. And you said yeah. that the, the motivation also, like not from a filmmaking point of view, but for, I would say, the political um, agenda, basically make people more aware of the threat that we live in because of all, you know, the what's going on in the world. And it's kind of, a, a, as you know, the, the film that I did, Guardian, you know, which also had this topic of a, of a threat it, it that has, can wipe out yeah. all humanity. You know, when I did Guardian, like I started 2010 working on it and we finished 2012. So I was like, and, and you know, the threat that came was, I think, like, you know, when also things with North Korea and so on, it was a phase where like they were testing stuff. And I was like, like, yeah. I hope when I finish that my short film won't be a documentary, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, because it, it became so... It, it seems like it is. Yeah. I it, mean, I watched your film. I was there at the premiere. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I loved it. Thank you. And nuclear weapons in space, mm. which is the main topic these days. With AI, you know, AI with system a controlling with AI. it. Yeah, like yeah. you never know. Like the Hi Hiroshima. Well, all of these are trending. All yeah. of these are trending topics. Yeah. Now, so I mean, Hiroshima. That's that's, point. that's what was back then, uh, forty-five, and now we're at a point. You said, I think you said, the nuclear weapons are three thousand times as as uh, impactful, more or powerful. dangerous, more powerful than, than it was back yeah. then. So it's it's just like you can't even grasp it in your in your mind. This like is how, this is as far as we know. Yeah, it could be more. Mm. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. Yeah, I'm. I want to ask you, yeah, as ask. I said, that Hiroshima costs like $3,000 yeah. mm -hmm. to make, because I, if you don't count my time, yeah, yeah which is like six months, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if you have a full crew and a full, of course, uh, you know, everything done like fully with all that stuff, mm -hmm. what, what, what would be your estimate for uh, the pr budget for such a film? If you didn't know that I made it and you just watched it, and you were asked to estimate the production budget, what would you give it? What would I give it? A good question. Like, I'm not the one who's... You, 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 dealt, you dealt with VFX before. Yeah, Sean. but I was never the, the numbers guy to say that way. Like, I was more on the creative side, <laughs> but still... Uh, I don't know, like something that's just really like a wild guess. Like a hundred k, hundred fifty, something like no, that. No, it would definitely definitely be more. Yeah. I mean, I I'm telling you from my experience with creating simulation, where I hired a visual effects exactly, company, yeah, mm. a professional, that it could be well above three hundred thousand. Okay, and was really. was this the reason why you wanted to do it yourself, or exactly, exactly? Okay. You know, uh, I have been training to do visual effects myself to reduce costs of producing content while also creating engaging and original content that everybody will watch and circulate around on social media. And um, uh, it's it's a learning curve and I keep learning new stuff. I've been integrating it in, uh, a lot in my content creation recently and it has been working great. But uh, uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is because uh, you and I had a conversation before where we talked about the excessive budgets that films are receiving these days. Uh, you have seen this film, My, uh, Godzilla Minus One. I haven't seen it yet, just the trailer, but I've seen I haven't it. seen it also, mm -hmm. I saw the trailers. I have been following the story of the visual effects team uh, and they produced it for what, 15 million? Mm -hmm. it, made more than, it made more than 100 million dollars yeah. at the box office. And it got the Oscar for, for best visual effects, effects yeah. mm -hmm. which proves that these budgets are excessive, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And we don't know where it's heading with AI, with AI and everything, you know. So exactly. So yeah, it's uh, with, no one with, knows with, where we're going to end Sora, up. With Sora, yeah. With Sora, yeah. everybody's. But is but tell be, me, from yeah. because you've been now doing this whole film by yourself, every shot shot one shot after the other one and you've basically been diving into this world where you've you know just been focusing on that now with the success that it's had would it be the same for you if you would have just prompted this whole thing and you got one shot after the other you know in terms of the satisfaction well look i would say it would still be the same okay because if, even prompting 
uh, it's not just a one-time result, okay? You're not gonna get the desired result from a single prompt from the first attempt. You will have to keep trying multiple times until you get the desired shot. And one of the things that AI has a problem with right now is consistency. Consistency with places, consistency with characters. Once that is solved, that will solve a big problem. Also the lip sync. You still can't make characters lips in really good way while creating a, uh, some character entirely from scratch. From but, Tappi, but still, as an artist, and you are an artist when you're being a filmmaker and a writer and everything, do you think the artistic touch in working on something visually is the same as if you do the prompting and you get the results think, a lot faster? I think it is pretty much the same because in the end, you are the one who wrote the prompt, right? You are the one who has an outlook of the final shot and what it should be like and what it should like or feel like. In the end, when you create an entire film with AI and you watch all the shots come together and all the story, okay, and the message that is delivered through this, you um, ask yourself, would have this movie made itself? No, it's your it vision. It doesn't, but there's, it's, I, I, I absolutely It's your vision, yeah. it's absolutely. your creativity. Yeah, it is. So yes, it is still an artistic work. It is, the, 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 not the issue, but you know, the thing where I'm a little bit skeptical is that, you know, the more, the more, I don't want to say hurdles, you know, but, but the, the more difficult it is to achieve something, the higher the reward feeling is. And the prompting will be easier over time, you know, mm -hmm. like now maybe it's so difficult. Of course. But maybe, you know, later on you will just take, you know, the short film that you have now and you will, you know, attach the file to whatever and you say, make this Tim Burton style, make this Christopher Nolan style, make this whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's going to yeah. get easier and easier. And like the thing that I have in my mind right now, maybe we'll arrive at a point where where it will be like in the movie Wally, -E, you know, like everything's been taken care of. Like there is no struggle here, just... Sitting around, we there, just yeah. have to yeah. enjoy life and uh, drink some water. Huh? Exactly, yeah, basically, basically. Like, yeah. I, like we don't know where it's heading. So I'm, I'm just like, I see the the, the 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 advantages, but I'm still like, I don't know where it's going. Honestly, uh, look, it's going to move us to a higher purpose. When people are challenged, I think there's been a long time where humans haven't been challenged by something really big. And AI now taking over almost every single job will force us to think about some other things, some other ways. Yeah. We will, it's, it's like really artificial selection. You are aware of the difference between natural selection and artificial selection. When two animals are fighting each other, okay, one is an uh, apex predator, which means it's the one that is, uh, uh, basically chasing the prey, the prey over time will have to de develop a new strategy or evolve a new way biologically to overcome that predatory behavior, okay? And that's very much the same. AI is chasing us with new things that it can do that we're incapable of. And this will force us to do or think about other ways to reach self-fulfillment and also to Put dinner on the table <laughs> yeah that's true but <laughs> yes <laughs> and and if you but still if you think i'm not gonna let this one go if you think back on work on hiroshima now for six months you really right. dived into this world you worked on shot per shot you even told me that that this like got you in this certain kind of mood where you really felt what was happening like it was doing something with you right it was traumatic yeah. uh, when i was working on the short film hiroshima i started seeing some nightmares because as you know i am the one who's doing the visual effects shots and sometimes you start creating one shot where there is a human body melting or a baby in the womb getting struck by debris caused by the explosion outside the mother's uterus and you're stuck with this scene for a few days, sometimes well over a week, it becomes a mental image in your mind, it comes to your nightmares. And I, I definitely saw a few nightmares there that forced me to fast track the production so that I can finish it faster. Mm. Uh, so, so it didn't take time uh, off then, and, and, you, you fast tracked. And, 
Yeah. Okay. And and so the realization comes from the fact that this was a real event and these things have happened mm. to real people. Yeah. So if it's a fictional story, like those people who work on horror films like Saw, where you see gore and you see graphic content really terrible, you know, it's 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 fictional. But if it's a real event, the impact is much bigger. So that's why um, I was at that moment. I think if, if if AI was there to speed things up, it could have been faster and I wouldn't have to go through this. But uh, keep in mind that even AI is uh, probably going to be limited. I don't think they're going to allow it to create gore content for a long time. Mm. But still, like that, you felt that and you had you experience those nightmares so you were really in this world so when people write comments maybe also japanese people who because there is also this this trauma that's been passed on over generations that's still with right. them basically of course so you get a glimpse of of what this f must have felt like you know of course you weren't there but you know it just, i did yeah. i mm. did honestly i remember one of the worst nightmares where um i was back in this nightmare and so i was uh I was back home in the village where I was born and I was inside our house. This is the nightmare. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is one of the nightmares. And uh, there was a guy who was assembling the atomic bomb, the okay. little boy, which kept, no, seriously. Mm -hmm. I said, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, I said, what does it look like? Run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and, okay. and me not able to think straight at that moment yeah. and instead of running away where were you going to run from an atomic bomb yeah. I went I went up to uh, the roof okay mm -hmm. which is basically you're still in the epicenter of the explosion of yeah. uh, and then pff, massive um, you know light the flash of light started okay because I was at the epicenter, which is like the center of the explosion. Look, you're at the epicenter. This is the very center of the explosion. The shock waves goes like this. So you're not affected if you're at the center. Yeah. You're not affected as much. If you're outside the center, that's when. And so I just had like a concussion. And then I, I, I wake up from still in the dreams, waking up. And there is mud, there are bodies. It's like a river of bodies, really. Just Wow, well, um, that sounds super intense, like Yeah, a river of bodies just floating and all of them, you know, their hands are basically to the top. Mm. Uh so it, it was crazy, it was crazy. And then mm. I I was trying to grab some of the hands to try if some of them are still alive to bring them up. And that's when I woke up, luckily. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think this is like, especially for filmmakers who really, um, yeah, attach themselves to a project for a longer time, then they really get to experience, like, like I said, just get a glimpse of, of what it is. And especially exactly. with such a topic, which is very intense. Um, how did, from from the comments that people wrote, did they feel that you do them justice in, in terms of, you know, bringing this, honoring what they've been through? Um, a lot of people did so. Yeah, they said it felt very real. Okay. The intensity of the subject resonated with them and they feel the suffering of those people. Um, and that's why the film brought a uh, really massive impact. Um, for some platforms, however, I had to create an uncensored version because they don't allow, sen uh, they don't allow graphic content. But in the places where they were seeing people experiencing the effect of the atomic bomb, okay, being vaporized or, uh, or, or basically melting or dying or, you know, walking like zombies, which is what was happening or their shadows. You know, yeah, their especially that shadows. part. I, I saw a short from you yeah. where you said that there were shadows on the on the walls or on the stairs, from, right. which was shielded by the people who got struck. But it's crazy. Like this is like, Ex exactly. would have never imagined something like this, you know. People who were close to the atomic bomb explosion were instantly vaporized due to the bomb's intense heat. Let's look at this image from the Hiroshima aftermath. 
This surface is cleaned by the intense heat and extreme radiation, while this area is still intact because it was protected by a person or an object that covered it. As a result, negative imprints of people and objects were imprinted onto different surfaces such as walls, steps, and roads, creating these horrifying shadows. These shadows show what a person was doing in their last moment. There are so many images that show the horror of the atomic bomb shadows, and a lot of objects with shadows still imprinted on them are displayed in museums in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because it's a real historic event, and because I tried to depict it in a realistic way, it resonated with a lot of people and it delivered that emotional impact. Uh, there is one film from Japan. It's called the, uh, it's called Barefoot Jim. And it's about the atomic bomb. And it does an incredible job at depicting the horrors of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, I did get some inspiration from that. I also got some inspiration from... Uh, real-life drawings made by Hiroshima survivors. If you look at these drawings, mm -hmm. they're haunting. Yeah. Yeah. And so what was your main goal or what did you want to achieve when people watch, watch the movie? Well, I mean, the message is very simple. Nuclear weapons are dangerous and lethal and we should oppose them. We should not endorse them. Mm. Okay. As they say, the ends do not justify the means. People say it was war. Okay. There were always many other ways to end it. Yeah? It's the fact that it end, it had to end this way, it's questionable. Mm. It's questionable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, these are nuclear bombs. I mean, there's so much, so many wars going on in the world right now where it's even traumatized. Like, what? It's not even. Like, just people being afraid of their lives every day. You know, a bomb can hit you anytime. It's, uh, it, it's you something You will only see the flash of light. Yeah. Mm. You will not even know when it hits. Mm. If you're lucky, you will be in a place where you'll be instantly gone. Your brain won't even have enough time to process what happened. Mm. Yeah. 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 So that's if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, yeah, then well, you have to. Well, you'll have to suffer the consequences of cancer and radiation, which and is a lot trauma. worse. Yeah, it's a lot worse. Mm. It's a lot worse. Yeah, yeah. So I guess you must have been part of you must have been happy when you were finished with the film to just you know like I done uh, for I now. Distance myself a little bit. Honestly, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently working on the next project, which is not related to bombs. Yeah, but, thankfully. Okay. <laughs> it's still a little bit controversial too. Okay, but. I'm thinking mm. of doing a, a short film similar to Hiroshima. Okay. But it would be set in modern time with a hydrogen bomb. Okay. okay. Or or a thermonuclear bomb. The mm. bomb that was mentioned in the film to have 3000 times more power than the one dropped on Hiroshima. Mm. Okay. And drop it probably on a familiar recognized city and show the horror. Maybe that would be even more impactful because if uh, Hiroshima wasn't impactful enough, even though it did a great job, maybe this one, which relates to our time, would have more uh, impact. You really want to go through this again? Like this whole experience of <laughs> this kind of... Uh, oh, wait you for know, AI, you know, until this I whole wait thing for goes AI. faster. I think, yeah. yeah, I think I'll wait for AI to, <laughs> to, to make sure. But honestly... Um, I have seen what it's capable of mm. with Sora, yeah. which which is part of OpenAI. It's incredible, but they said it's long way from public access. Mm. It's still exclusive to certain artists. So yeah, we'll have to wait. So you just mentioned this new project. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about it, or is it still? Mm, uh, it's confidential. It's confidential. Okay, so so we wait. Only for you that. know about it. I've yeah. already told you about okay. it. So that's good. <laughs> so when when can people expect you to to drop some hints on what it will be about? I would say in a month or two. Okay. So in a month or two, it'll be ready, mm -hmm. and they will get to know about it. Okay. I assure you. All I assure right. you that. Yeah. So uh, one more question I have, since you're a creative polymath, what's like a random skill that you would still like to learn? A random skill that I'd like to learn? Yeah, like um, in, in terms of filmmaking, like doesn't just have filmmaking or any other skill 
could be paragliding. I don't know, like just something that that you. It's were... uh, honestly playing violin. Playing violin, okay. There was a time when I started learning violin, and mm-hmm. then I stopped. It's just a complicated. If you haven't, if you haven't started, you. yeah, okay. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. well. AI will just you know you give it a prompt and it will create it. But well, again, we don't. Yeah, yeah, not the same. You, yeah, <laughs> you, you want to do it because yeah. you enjoy doing it. Exactly. Um, but I did start at some point uh, learning violin, and it was so complicated. I, I had a private instructor. And I was starting to get really good at it. And then life got on the way. Uh, I, I just recently gifted that violin to someone who wanted to learn. I said, you're more qualified to. Okay. But, to you, take this. but you didn't, but you just still didn't give, give up on the stream. So there's still something there. I wouldn't say I gave up completely on mm-hmm. it, but you could say I postponed it. Okay. The dream. Mm-hmm. I I I am I embraced whistling instead because I I'm good at whistling. Yeah, almost the same. Can, you know, uh, whistling, playing violin, whatever. It's just some sounds, you know. <laughs> so, it, so yeah, but it's fine. just it's just um, it's just that um, different sounds and different uh, ways of doing things. Mm. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. My friends tell me that I whistle professionally, so okay. that's, uh, that's pretty good. All yeah. right, so maybe uh, this is not the project that's coming out in a month, like a whistle song from you, but uh, but you know, who knows? Like, life can always <laughs> deliver unexpected things. Can, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. With all the projects, yeah. with how far this career has taken me, yeah. trying different things, the last thing would be is dropping an album. Huh? Who knows? You know, with, with AI <laughs> or a video as well, clip you can whistle something and it can make like an orchestral whatever. You know, like believe it or not, happen. it does. Yeah, it actually does. Yeah, yeah there see? is a tool for that. Yeah, see, there is. See? Not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> there is a tool for that. Yeah. You know, to the outside, it it may look that whatever you touches turns into gold. You know. Uh, um, science communicator speaking on on stages on TEDx, uh, writing a novel. You know these. Most people don't do one of those things, and you've done all that. So it may look on the outside like everything is easy, but I guess it it isn't always. Like there is much on on the in the background happening. Um, can you tell me like a challenge where you really kind of struggled, or which was difficult for you, and how you overcame it? Honestly, I would say, you know, one of the challenges, because I try different things. Mm-hmm. Okay, the first time you try something, it can be a little bit complicated because you're still in the learning phase. Uh, when I wrote the novel simulation, which was based on the film, I, I came from a filmmaking background mm-hmm. and were familiar with the screenplay. I selected an editor, two editors actually, who have worked with science fiction and they loved the novel. Uh, Some of the comments were constructive. Some of the comments, you would read them and you would feel your potential as a writer is uh, questionable, right? (laughs) Questionable to say it in a nice way, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But you really have to press on because you believe in your ideas. Mm. And so... um, And was there any moment where you were like having doubts or was it always for you like, okay, uh, I got it, just continue? No, no, I, I... I never honestly had doubts about it. So one of the things that I did when I read negative reviews is a technique that I already uh, used multiple times. Which is delete occasions. them? <laughs> what? No, no, no. no. <laughs> just kidding, no, no, just no. kidding. Actually, if yeah. you delete them, mm-hmm. first of all, in, in, in certain platforms, you cannot delete them. Mm-hmm. And second, if you really delete them, mm-hmm. you're making people question the authenticity of, yeah. of all the reviews. Mm-hmm. There has to be some negative reviews. Yeah. When there is a negative review, whether on an, 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 an a film or a video or a project that I worked on, I go to works of art that I love and enjoy. And I read negative reviews of that. And that gives yeah, me that's satisfaction. A, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 Whatever I did mm. is not going to satisfy everybody and I have to live with it. Mm. You, you would say, let's say, you know, you go to, uh, uh, let's say, you know, my, I mean, you can't compare my novel to really big works of art that is uh, that has received incredible. I mean, some you, you see on Goodreads, some of them have like two hundred thousand reviews, mm-hmm. and the total rating is four or four point two. Mm-hmm. But there are still negative reviews. Mm-hmm. You go filter them by the negative reviews of these big publishers and big authors. 
And I say, you know what? If they can't get a negative review, why should I be worried? Okay. This also applies to films. If there is a, a work or a film or a video, just go read negative reviews of other works of art that are much bigger, that people have spent more time and more money working on them. And especially if you love that project and you see these negative reviews, you won't be shaken. I mean, in the end, art is a taste of, you know, it's personal taste and exactly. taste is subjective. Like, you know, I love chocolate. Other people hate cho chocolate. So, you know, it's the same with art. I think uh, everybody loves chocolate, though. Well, huh? I know people that's who don't. Unfair, that's I an know unfair people, I know people who don't. And <laughs> I, I, I don't get along with them because I just get along oh. with people who like to. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's super sub sub subjective and art in general. So, but I think it's this, a taste. this it's technique. It's a personal taste. Yeah, this technique is really... Uh, didn't think about that one, but but yeah, even the highest rated movies on IMDb, um, as you said, have, Definitely. have negative reviews. So, Interstellar, yeah. mm. Interstellar, mm. which is my favorite film. It has, oh, it's one of my favorites too as well, by the way. Yeah, I, mm. I, I gave it 10 out of 10 because mm. I loved it. I love mm. the visual effects, the, the surprising plot, mm. okay? Uh, you go and you see a lot of negative reviews for that as well. Mm. The, uh, Dune. Dune Part 2, which I just watched recently. I still I, did. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. 9.5 from mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. out of 10. Loved it. Again, there were still some uh, uh, reviews that are negative. Again, you can never create a work of art that is 100% well received. And if you put your work in public, be ready mm -hmm. for negative reviews. Yeah. Otherwise, don't put your work in public. Absolutely. That's it. That's true. Yeah. So apart from that, was there, if this is not pers not too personal, if it is, then no problem. But uh, was there any other moment in your life where you struggled and at least for a while didn't know how to how to handle it or how to to go through it, where you were like really felt that you didn't have the tools or the skills or were just like, yeah, struggling to, to go through it, where it's not uh, just like, oh, you know, going up, but yeah. I did actually. Yeah. So um, I graduated and got my bachelor's degree in biotechnology from Pakistan, University of Peshawar. Great place. I learned a lot. I met incredible people, made a lot of amazing friends. I love the place. I love the culture and everything. Uh, in terms of education, it was also good. And then I moved to Germany to do my master's to do my master's in uh, molecular biotechnology. There was a shock because the educational system in uh, Pakistan was mostly theoretical. You're not allowed to touch equipment, work in a lab, it's mostly theory. But when you move to Germany, they expect you to already know these things based on your bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. You know how to handle this experiment, you know how to handle this machine and you don't, mm. so you can imagine. Um, Plus, I think so was, with, a, with the language, when you moved to Germany, you, you didn't, did you speak German? It, I mean, it was in English too. Okay. The language okay. of instruction for yeah. the master's program mm. that I was part of, mm. it was in English, but the fact that I didn't possess the skills that would immediately prepare me to conduct experiments independently but luckily I was surrounded with some friends who were really helpful. Some were not, I gotta be very honest with you. Some were not very helpful. They, 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 they would, they would make my, uh, honestly make fun of me for not knowing a certain technique, but me knowing that it is for my own benefit to acknowledge my limitations, especially when it comes to wanting to learn about new things, it's the only way I'm going to learn. And regardless, there will always be people who are helpful. And I'm really thankful that they were there to help me overcome this stage. But that was a stage where I honestly, if, if they were, if it wasn't for their help, I don't think I would have managed to do it all on my own. Mm. And yet still, yeah. it seems that you have a pretty high level of resilience. Uh, what did you think? How? Uh, who taught you that? How did you get that? Was it always there or is, is it something that you developed over time? Also the process of, you know, uh, studying and everything. Look, it's a trial and error, right? Mm. 
-hmm. Life always puts us in very difficult situations. And uh, the way we approach these difficult situations uh, makes us who we are. I remember in uh, an instance where uh, a professor told me that you will not make it here. Really? really. In, when you were in Germany? I'm not going to mention <laughs> names. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but but um, I was really close to booking a ticket and just leaving. Because if, you, if, mm -hmm. you, if your professor is uh, the one who is uh, creating a hurdle for you, mm. what hope is there left for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's hard. Yeah. Uh, I guess so, this must uh, have, like in that moment at least, it must have been harsh in yeah, this moment. It, too. Was, it, it was soul crushing. Mm. Really. Mm. As I told you, within a week, I was almost like wanting to fly back. But then I remembered my entire career was built on resilience and really going through difficult situations and facing them. That along with uh, advice from people who I trust, who I only do these things to. Um, honestly, we all need that th this kind of people to be by our side, to share. Sometimes people don't have trust to share. I totally understand, but you got to have at least one person to trust, to share with. And, I'm, and I, so I shared with one person very close to me, uh, who was my brother. Okay. He and, he and I have been through thick and thin in our entire career. And he, he, he told me an advice. I remember those difficult nights when, you know, uh, we would just look at the moon and uh, uh, really say, one day we're going to go there. And now you just want to flee, escape? No, continue. And, uh, and so I remember his words and I remember the words of the professor saying, you know, you're not going to make it here. And uh, yeah, I decided to just push through as I always did. Uh, needless to say, that professor got to meet me years later mm. after yeah and uh he, yeah, had a different view. he had a different view oh he, he did oh, that's view. nice yeah at least you, know, you don't mm. you don't really have to confront people sometimes yeah sometimes you like, just, just have to just prove them one wrong look can be enough sometimes you know like yeah, yeah. you don't have to mm. confront them mm. just prove them wrong mm. and that's it but i think okay. you mentioned a very important point which I think especially, uh, which I also talk about in some of my videos, which a lot of men struggle with, is if you if you go through a hard time that it's not wrong to share this, that you don't have to pretend to be super strong and super in, um, um, untouchable exactly. because no one is, basically. No one is. Yeah, no one and is. We, all have, we all have feelings and we all have times where we feel that we won't make it or that it's hard and just to acknowledge this and to share it because there are people that like in general we're together stronger you know than than we're on our own and just sharing can be such a great help even if the circumstances don't change but you know just us having someone to talk to and feel seen in this moment can be super helpful so i think it's a yeah, yeah. yeah. we're all we're all we all have our own insecurities and vulnerabilities and we have to acknowledge that okay only a narcissist would believe that they have no insecurities or vulnerabilities uh, but acknowledging our limitations is the only way for us to overcome these limitations and sharing um, is one way mm. of course you don't want to overshare you don't want to just share with anybody mm. we're talking about Close, close friends, people, yeah, of very, very yeah. close, like mm. really close, yeah, yeah, mm. and and it really helps a lot. Yeah. It really, you know, that's why, yeah. that's why you know, there's talk therapy, yeah, of course, and psychotherapy, yeah, and psychiatry. Yeah. There are specific fields for these things, of course, yeah, 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 and it works. It's not like mumbo jumbo. It it definitely no. works. So it works like a charm. This yeah. is this is based on 
hundreds of years of studying mm. uh, human behavior. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, what you said, you know, like it's not oversharing or something, but I think it's, you know, for those who overshare, it's good to like take a step back and actually do something about it. And others who are just doing the whole time without sharing anything and trying to be strong the whole time, it's good to take a step back and, you know, slow down, acknowledge your feelings, share, talk about it. It's always like, because, you know, yeah, you can overcompensate yeah. in one direction or into the other direction. But in the end, it's like, you know, the gold middle too. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But also at the same time, you get a different perspective from another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of especially course. If they, mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially, you know, people have stories and they heard stories and they say, oh, you know what? You know, the first person who have, who told me something like this. I know someone else who did it and this is how they overcame this problem. So they gave you a suggestion. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now one of the things that I don't do though is sharing my problems online. I still keep my private life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you will never see me do that. Uh, so I hope it will never come to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's yeah. always it's always a fine balance, especially if you are someone who has so many followers as you do. Um, and I mean, you've shared like some personal stuff now already, but. Um, you know, for me, like the, the stuff that I talk about, I do have to share more because I think especially in terms of vulnerability, no, you know, yeah, especially it's, it's the type of content you are sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that requires you to give personal stories because yeah. people connect yeah. to these stories. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean personal yeah. stories, but you know, it's it's not also like like it doesn't have to be like a completely soul strip tease or something, but you know, it's it's still like because for me, like the, the, I did a recent video, which I'm still going to upload here, where I go into a process and, you know, like some old trauma that comes up and so on. Of course, it wasn't easy to share this on camera, but in the same time, like I, I shared it on my German channel and I got feedback from people saying like, you know, this touched me so much and it's good to see people out there who show their vulnerability and, you know, especially for men, they should do like, you know, as you said, delivering value and making an impact and everyone does it in his way, basically, you know, right. so. Right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's, absolutely. that's where this goes. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. we, t we touched yeah. on a lot of topics. That's yeah, really good. Absolutely. Okay, Ashim. So I want to thank you for taking time uh, and sharing what you've been working on and also all the personal things that you shared. I appreciate this very much. Thanks, and uh, I'm looking forward to what you're going to release in a month. And yeah, a month or two. A month or basically. two. All right. Not going to nail yeah. it on, on that. <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank Ashim. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks.